Hello, my name is David Lankus. I'm the Virginia and Charles Bowden Ch uh, Professor of Librarianship here at the University of Texas at Austin. And I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to submit this video so I could have some comments and thoughts. And uh, I really appreciate the ability to access such bright people on this. I want to talk today about AI and generative AI, and particularly about how librarians and their skills need to be prepared to respond to this world. Because let's face it, it's changing amazingly rapidly. I mean, I'm recording this on the 10th of April just to get it in time for translation and et cetera. And I have little doubt that by the time you're watching this, I may have been replaced by an AI robot here at the University of Texas. I'd be a lot easier to control. But it's amazing, right? We've seen millions of people sign up for ChatGPT. Just in a short matter of month or two, we're talking about changing search engines. We're talking about integrating this ability to generate text and such into word processors, into presentations, into all sorts of systems. And we're not just talking about text and human readable text, we're also talking about images and we're talking about deep fakes and we're talking about things where we're having data, algorithms, generate materials that we thought and previously were only able to be generated by human beings. And that means we need to learn to evaluate things differently because it's not human beings doing it. And that comes with a whole host of things about who do you trust and are they consistent and stuff we'll talk about briefly. But I want to get into sort of two ideas. I want to get into the sort of typical way in which librarians respond to new technologies. I sort of think of it as trying to catalog websites where it's a new technology. Let's try and shove it into an old way of doing things. And when the World Wide Web first went big, there were many librarians who worried about how do we create mark records around web pages. Even those web pages are changing minute by minute. So how do we avoid that step where we're simply painting around the edges of something that's changing the world? And so I want to get, start with how we can respond. But then I want to talk about the skills and how we need to be part of the development and evolution. And to do that, I want to change the frame. So I'm going to talk about AI sometimes about artificial intelligence, but I want to start with the frame of augmented intelligence. That is that these capabilities, these new tools, this new software are allowing us as human beings to do things in a different way, to do things faster, to do things in some ways better, to do things that use our unique human views and literacies and help us amplify the effects that we have. Imagine now that we can, as authors, publish to many things and we can generate social media. We can do all these things that used to take a lot of people to do. We could do it quickly and we have to hope well. So let's get into it and we'll start with what I call the impact conversation. That is, what is the impact and what do librarians do about the impact? So in a minute, I'll talk about librarians changing the core, changing how we actually build and deliver and disseminate and propagate AI. But let me just briefly talk about that impact, how we can avoid cataloging websites, if you will. There are going to be many things that our communities, whether those are academic communities, municipalities and villages, schools, what have you, how they're going to need us to guide them through a changing world, changing very rapidly. We know, for example, that artificially, artificial intelligence is generating texts, and those texts and images are going to end up in our collections. How do we assign authorship? How does a mark record capture something that's going to change based on an algorithm's feeling of the day? How are we going to highlight the differences? Are we going to tell people these are different types of authorship or not? That's happening as we speak. We've seen magazines and literary magazines, all these folks basically stopping submissions because they're getting drowned in artificial generated text stories and materials that frankly right now aren't very good. But what happens when they can't necessarily tell the difference? How are they going to allow these things to happen? We're seeing it right now in image collections, where in art programs and in art competitions, people are submitting AI-generated art. How can we identify it? How can we determine it? How can we change it? How do we assess it? Right? And that's the other part. We can talk about how we need to assess these systems. How we, you know, which one does what better? Which one's more consistent? Which one hallucinates less than the other? Hallucination being an AI term for where the computer literally makes things up. 
how do we know what kinds of answers come from which system and which are better? It's kind of like the old days where we were interpreting individual interfaces for databases. Now we're kind of doing therapy on AI to see where it's comfortable and see where we're comfortable with that response, which is less creepy, which is more creepy, etc. So we need to be involved in that because these are information sources, they're information gathering and seeking services. We should be able to assess ChatGPT versus BARD versus LAMA versus etc. We all need to know that the answers we're getting are in flux. If you ask the same question of any sort of depth over a set of days and weeks, the answers will change. Now, if we do that to people where they are not consistent in giving their answers, they lose credibility. We don't trust them anymore. We don't go back to them. But with these systems, they provide convincing answers once, and people don't normally go back to try it again and again to see that they're not consistent. How do we let people know that's the case? And how do we help people eventually shape consistency as an attribute of AI systems? And we know that AI needs to be taught, not just how to use it, but the limitations. For example, the image that you're seeing here on the screen, that is an AI generated image. And if you're wondering what the prompt was, there's a whole, by the way, world of prompt engineering that's coming up. Think of it as reference question, revenge of the reference question. The prompt was a future, uh, future school librarian. What does a futuristic school librarian look like? And that's what it came up with. And now what's interesting is you look at it and you can say, oh, it's, I like it, I don't like it. That eye on the one side is pretty wonky. I can tell it's generated, it's not real. That's interesting. But what we need to teach is it has a white face. It's standing behind a rack of books. That's interesting, it's sort of stereotypical. It has glasses, stereotypical, right? It is a female-esque image stereotype, right? This image that's being generated, without controls, without thought, just because it's sort of, we, this is fun and easy. We need to show that it turns out that large language models captured off the internet don't just capture the correct and polite and civic text. It collects stereotypes, limitations, hate speech, it collects incorrect, trolling, lies, manipulation, misinformation, and disinformation. And we need to prepare our communities that while it's convincing, and interesting doesn't make it accurate or reliable. But all of these functions, they fit into our current world. We currently collect things and we worry about collection development. We currently assess information sources and let people know about it. We understand that when articles change, what that's good or bad in scholarly communication. And we teach information literacy, we teach different tools all the time. So this isn't much of a change for us. Frankly, there's no new skills other than spending time with these systems. What I wanna talk about is how do we get to the core of what this does? How do we change AI and not think so much about how AI changes us? And we need to start with our image of librarians, which has changed over time, right? You we look at librarians and their roles and what they know and they change remarkably. We're not, for example, Catherine Hepburn. And if you're saying, okay, what does that mean? Um, this might be an English reference, but there was a great movie called Desk Set that came out in the 1960s with uh, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, a great pairing, in which a computer was being brought into a newsroom reference center where librarians were there to answer questions. And this is an example of where the computer goes wrong and Catherine Hepburn demonstrates that librarians, as we all know, are brilliant, and demonstrates it by her knowledge and memorization of an obscure 80 stanza poem. So I apologize to the translators, but this is well worth watching. Not curfew, Miss Lana, curfew. I'm terribly sorry, I didn't understand the spelling. Sylvia, give him curfew. The island of Corfu is situated off the coast of Albania near the mouth of the Adriatic. Scenery beautiful, climate pleasant, soil fertile. Let's see what little Emmy has to say. You're welcome. Hello. What the devil is this? It's the going. Curfew shall not ring tonight. Isn't that nice? Crumble will not come till sunset and her lips grew strangely white. 
As she breathed the husky whisper, curfew must not a ring uh, tonight. Mr. Sumner, what can I do? Nothing. You know you can't interrupt your in the middle of a sequence. Yes, but Mr. Sumner, quiet. Just, just, just listen. Solemn, though, she had listened while the judges read without a tear or sigh at the ringing of the curfew, Basil Underwood must die. Uh, how long does this go on? That old poem has about 80 stanzas to it. Where are we now? He has reached the topmost ladder. O'er her hangs the great dark bell. Awful is the gloom beneath her like the pathway down to hell. Though the ponderous tongue is swinging, tis the hour of curfew now. And the sight has chilled her bosom, stopped her breath, and paled her brow. Shall she let it ring? No, never. Flash her eyes with sudden light as she springs and grasps it firmly. Curfew shall not ring tonight. They hung up. The reason I want you to watch that video, one, because I love it, but it's also this idea that a librarian knew everything. They memorized all the materials. We owned the books, we read the books. So an obscure poem with 80 stanzas, of course we memorize it. But that was the metaphor of librarianship, the sort of know-it-all. That's changed, particularly as digital materials became available, as those computers came in, when we could begin to search things on CD-ROMs and online back in the 80s, etc. And then librarians became an optimized database search engine when it cost, you know, 10 cents a hit or a dollar a hit or $30 for a computing minute, et cetera. We needed someone who was efficient in speaking Boolean and speaking to the computers and librarians became search experts. We became experts in how we phrase questions and look at questions. As that evolved, as it naturally did, and eventually we looked at search engines and the web and this massive, trillions of web pages librarians once again couldn't memorize it all but now they were the better search engines we could search with a heart we could speak to a person understand what they need and manipulate and work in the systems these were never proper accurate metaphors but they were the ones that we spoke to ourselves they were the ones that were in the public eye they were different senses of it and so it made really easy to say, well, we'll teach ChatGPT and we'll look at ChatGPT resources and eventually a librarian is just a human ChatGPT that can generate answers, but it's not. In all of these cases, what a librarian is, is a facilitator. They facilitate learning. Sometimes that is finding an 80 stanza poem. Some of that time is a quick reference. Some of that time is working a search engine, but all of that time is working with the community Again, an academic community, a public community, a school community, a hospital community, a newspaper community to see what they need to know, what they want to know, where they want to be, and to bring resources to help people become knowledgeable. The role of a librarian isn't to know it all. It's not to be able to find it all. The role of a librarian is help a community aspire to want it, what it wants to be, help communities make smarter decisions, and help people find meaning in their lives. And this means that we can't just sit on the outside of ChatGPT and look at its ripples and try and help people surf the waves. We have to be part of the conversation about how that evolution occurs. We need to look at these systems and be able to talk and document the systems. And AI has made a big change, and so therefore we need to start talking about what librarians need to know. We have looked at AI for a long time as an interesting hobby. As long as there have been computers, there have been people trying to create human brains out of them. And it hasn't worked very well until suddenly we had a massive ubiquitous network with a huge amount of data and trillions of web pages online, and we could suddenly get all this digital data and feed it into new algorithms, new ways of understanding things. We moved off the idea of frames and natural language processing and trying to compute every possible way something could happen to inductive algorithms, things like Bayesian queries and machine learning and what have you, that could just eat up massive data, find its own regularities, and that turns out it could be remarkably good at responding to certain types of queries. And that's what we need to begin to look at. So we need to understand in the vocabulary of AI what we can do about this. So right now, we tend to be in a pretty muddled way, AI and generative AI and whether it's, you know, general AI or specific AI, or big data, algorithms, deep learning, smart learning, etc. What does all this mean? 
I want to, for the purpose of talking about librarian skills, break it down to three interlocking areas. We have data. That data can be a bunch of recordings, it can be trillion web pages, it can be 5,000 images, it can be a bunch of spoken word, but we have a lot of data generated by machines, captured by machines through human operation. It is plentiful, it is not inherently organized, but it is available. That data can now be worked on by algorithms because we have sufficient computing power, which is taking a huge amount of our power and generating an amazing amount of heat. We're taking computing power and we're running that data to begin to make sense of it, to organize it, to find it, to index it. But the new part that's really pushing us forward is how machine learning, certain algorithms that work inductively, that is rather than programming, look for the following things, it says, here's a bunch of stuff, see what you find and then trimming and changing as it goes, Bayesian queries, Markov models, deep learning, all of these different ways of thinking are, how do we go through and begin to understand this data in a different way? How can we generate something that approximates, given the context, human intelligence and human generation, given enough data? That's what we're talking about. So what I wanna do just briefly, and then I will get off the stage, is take each one of these layers and talk about what I think librarians need to know in each of these. So for example, under machine learning, we really need librarians that can do training, that can build training sets, that can identify text materials, say this is the kind of thing we're looking for, and begin to train these, these models ethically, equitably, making sure that we represent if we're doing image generation of human beings. We don't just put a bunch of white people in there. We put people of all different complexions, races, and backgrounds. We need to deal with the idea of hallucinations. Once again, these generative AI systems make stuff up. My favorite is when they were doing image generation just, and once again, two months ago, it was really easy to tell if it was AI generated, if it had hands in it, because it turns out AI would tend to add a finger or two. So you could just check the hand and say, oh, that's fake, or that's not fake. So we need to be able to go in and say, oh, this is wrong. Increasingly, when people ask questions like, could you compare and contrast Chaucer's Canterbury Tales to Monty Python and the Holy Grail to go in and say, well, this is a real resource. This is not a real resource. This is peer reviewed and begin to help AI do things properly. Diverse test sets. We need to be able to evaluate and we need to provide transparency to these algorithms. On the data side, librarians need to understand data sets and data wrangling. How does this data come in? How old is it? How useful is it? What are some of the definitions? We need to understand privacy, but we need to understand privacy in a different way. The kinds of things we're generating, the questions that we ask, the kind of data that's being provided into these systems, we need to understand how these systems take care of people's privacy. Intellectual property, data stewards. We're seeing in many cases things like smart cities where in fact um, companies want to generate a lot of data based on where you live, where you work, where you walk, how you drive, all of these things. We need to talk about public data stewards where we don't simply give away a community's data to a commercial service, but we talk about how they can provide service on a community's data that is protected. Basic data hygiene, basic ontological development, knowledge trees, how are different information and words and concepts connected. All of that's still very important and it grows on our work around thesauri, it grows around our work on public services, but it is new in this context and we need to have those services. Within algorithms, we need to understand, and this is really important, we need to be advocates and we need to have our communities advocate for things like explainable AI. When you have these inductive systems, these Bayesian models, all these fancy ways of taking huge amounts of text and coming to conclusion. One of the serious problems is even the programmers and sometimes the system has no idea how it came to its response. So explainable AI is a movement to have programmers insist and build in explanation models. Why did you make this choice? What choices did, were presented? What flaws in the data? So that we can audit these systems and know whether this is accurate, whether this is meant to be accurate or not. Advocacy is a strong and vital role for librarians in the days of AI. We need to fight for our communities for the common good because that's what we begin to look at. What skills do librarians need? 
Well, for machine learning, project management and assessment. Do we know where the data is? Have we kept the data? Do we have a provenance of the data? How do we send the data in? And is it doing the right thing? Under the data side, data literacy, understanding what is good data, where does it come from? Doing ontology and taxonomy development, policy and having research skills. And for algorithms, facilitation and community engagement. What's happening is that these AI systems are being built behind closed doors and they're gathering public data to do things and have value and to make money. And we need to have people on the inside mobilizing communities to say, this is our data, we have a right to know how it's going to be used. This is our data, we have a right to be forgotten. This is our data, we have a right to understand what, this, what is happening. This is about librarians engaging directly with the community to empower the community to ask the hard questions. If AI is gonna put people out of work, who's asking whether that's a good thing or a bad thing? If AI is going to put someone out of work, who's there to train them and prepare them for the next thing? How can we talk about the rights of people? How can we ensure those rights through policy, regulation? This is about advocacy. What the number one skill that librarians need around AI is not our ability to do data science. It is our ability to mobilize our communities to action, oversight, and accountability. That's what we need to do. And to intelligently do it, we need to understand things like data and ontologies and transparency. But all of that helps us do the preservation of the common good. How do we make sure that these kinds of capabilities, the great powerful capabilities, are available to all? How do we understand regulation to ensure that these algorithms are not put to negative use? How do we insist on things like watermarking to identify AI-generated materials? How do we talk about building trust when these algorithms can generate convincing disinformation? That's the role of a librarian. And being on the outside, watching it from a distance, we are limited in our ability to accomplish our task. We must be in the development process. We must be part of the policy conversations. We must be talking about housing data, generating data, knocking on doors, and insisting that there is a public oversight of these different models and this different generation. So in conclusion, and by the way, an AI-generated picture of the future of librarians. We've got a long way to go, folks. We must not treat this as the latest reference thing to be cataloged. AI is not just another search engine to be thought about. AI is going to fundamentally talk about information generation and the information life cycle. It is actively going to either erode or support public trust. It is going to be able to generate a new way of media consumption, and we need to be available. We must be the voice of the common good. If it's not us, then whom? Who is a trusted hyper-local resource that can be part of looking at these systems and ensuring that our communities have a level of oversight and safety around this work. This isn't about Skynet and Terminator stuff. This is about creating law by someone typing in what they want and having a convincing legal document pop out and then assuming it's good. This is about lazy teacher being able to put in prompt and get a lesson plan out and not necessarily understand how it's going to change people's understanding of minds. How do we go in and ensure that AI tools are benefiting society? Our skills must continue to evolve. We have to understand these systems. We need to get more technical literacy. We need to understand what a large language model is. We need to understand what deep learning algorithms are. But we are not this is not about our values changing in the light of it. We still believe in service. We still believe in learning. We still believe in the idea of diverse sources and diverse people being important resources. We believe in intellectual freedom and safety. We believe that a library should be a safe place, safe place to explore dangerous ideas. And so how do we do that? We get out of our buildings. We become part of the development process, part of the regulatory process part of the advocacy process that steers AI and doesn't simply respond to it. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. I hope we can continue to talk online.